Good morning. Good morning. Hey. <laughs> Is everybody having fun at DevNet Create? Yeah? Ready for day two? For people who've been hacking, ready for day three? So uh, it's really been amazing. So I want to thank you all. I know once again, energy throughout. People are getting hands-on with APIs. Some stayed out very late last night. Did anyone stay out late last night? Create after dark? <laughs> so, uh, you know, once again, DevNet Create is all about community, and it's all about you. And we're really thankful for all that you put into this and put into participating, joining in, really changing how you think about your careers, how you think about your skills. We're here to help. So once again, thank you for being all in here at DevNet Create. This morning, our uh, teams that have been hacking at Camp Create cre uh, read out on their projects. I understand there was actually a lot of working code. Was there a lot of working code today? <laughs> so I want to thank you for getting in there, really building some really, really cool things and sharing those. I'm sorry I wasn't at the readout, but I'm going to get a briefing on all of those. And it's really amazing what you're able to achieve there. And so uh, we're going to hear more. And I think that really it's all about hands-on code, right? And so what we want to do today is have two things this morning. So first of all is a DevNet demo jam. Demo jam, you guys ready? And what we're going to do is we have you know, our folks. We, we make our folks code, too, and our community members. And they're going to come up and show you different projects in code that they've written and built that bring a bunch of things to life. So we're excited to share those with you. And they'll come in. You'll get your kind of rapid fire you know, looking at these different projects. And hopefully, it'll inspire you to about even more things that you can create. Um, next, we're also then going to have Connect to Create. And Connect to Create was a theme that we were talking about last year. And really, it's, again, all about the connections that you have with each other. It's about coming out, having new ideas together, finding new opportunities to connect with each other, with the DevNet team, with everything. And so we actually have some topics that we had asked people to submit, and you have submitted a number of topics. We're actually going to split up into groups and let you all talk and work on these different topics, and then come and read out on those. And so we want everyone to be active in that discussion. And the more active you are, the more people will get to know you, the better ideas that we're going to come up with together as a group. So we're really looking forward to seeing those as well. So I think what we're going to do is actually get started here. Uh, Mandy is going to start and host our demo jam. And let's get right to code. OK, thanks, thanks so Mandy. much. Thanks, Susie. So um, like Susie was saying, today in this morning session, we really want to put the focus on community. In giving you some inspiration for things that you can build, and also giving you a time to connect with everyone. Um, real quick, I just wanted to bring, we have a, a team of people in DevNet, our developer advocates and our developer support team, who are primarily here to help you, um, to help you with your code, to help you answer questions. And I just wanted to bring them on stage for just one second so you can recognize all the faces and know that all these people are here to mentor you. So come on up, all the advocates, dev support. Fast, fast, fast. Come on. All right. So we're gonna do we're gonna do a really rapid fire. Um, just name an area that you focus on uh, because I want you to know if I've got a question about contact center. This is who I can go to. And this group of people is absolutely available and here and willing to help. And you may recognize some of them from the forums or the chat rooms, you know, places that you've been. So really quick, oh, you get to start. Uh, I'm supporting for uh, DNA Center, and uh, I'm from, I forgot, uh, like. Uh, <laughs> name, name and what you do, part. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Gyogis. Uh, I'm uh, basically working uh, uh, from India, Indian time zone, and uh, supporting uh, WebEx teams chat, chat, chat forums. Awesome, thank you. So he is, he is so active in our forums. I think everybody probably recognizes his name. And he came all the way from India to be here. So thank you so much. All right, quick. I'm John McDonough. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm, 
<laughs> Is this thing on? Um, John McDonough, I'm a developer advocate supporting uh, data center automation, UCS, uh, ACI, things like that. All right, you can just get straight on the line. Yao Ming Chen, I'm developer support supporting the network, networking related APIs. Awesome. I'm uh, Stuart Clark, uh, uh, dev developer advocate looking at network automation and part time unicorn breeder. <laughs> Hey, uh, Matt Johnson, I do anything containers, cloud, orchestration, Kubernetes, um, if you are automating workloads in containers um, across any of our products or at the edge or in data center, yeah, that's, that's me. Hi, Eric Thiel, I lead the team of developer advocates uh, working for Mandy, so um, any, a bunch of the folks on the stage are on my team. Awesome. He's my boss. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm Kareem Iskander. I am based out of San Jose, and uh, I focus on Cisco DNA Center, um, but I do everything else as well. So. <laughs> uh, I'm Kishan Veer. I focus on uh, security. So if you have any questions with respect to Umbrella, AMP, Firepower, um, Threat Grid, um, all the awesome security products, you can reach out to me. I'm not active black hat, so don't be scared. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Ann Gentle. I lead the content and support team for DevNet. And um, you can come to me with, if you see something, say something. So if there's anything on the website, anything in Learning Labs, please report it. We want to make everything better. Hey, my name is Apu. I'm from the DevNet application team. I'm focused on the, all the web-related technologies. Awesome. Yeah, hi, I'm Charles Eckel. Uh, I'm the person for you to come to if you have uh, interest in contributing to Code Exchange. Adrian. I also do a lot with uh, open source and with standards across our entire uh, portfolio. I'm Paul Zimmerman. I manage the DevNet developer support team. So if you need help with anything, uh, I, I can help you out there. Hi, I'm Nicholas Petrelli. I'm part of the DevNet support team, collaboration, do some tutorials, sample code, things like that. Hey. David Stout, um, I cover uh, Cisco Collaboration Technology APIs for uh, on-cloud uh, and on-premise. Hi, I'm Jock Reed. I cover all things IoT and also containerization and edge, just like Matt over here. Awesome. Hi, I'm Adrian Moharic, and I'm with uh, Developer Experience. Hi, I'm Steph, and I'm a lot about collaboration APIs, and I also work on the API experience as a whole across all our products. Awesome. Thank you. And where's Denise? She's, she's still working outside. She's outside. So Denise Kwan is another a developer advocate, developer support. She focuses on contact center and finesse. And if you have any finesse questions, she is the go-to person. So thank you guys very much. Thanks for coming up. <laughs>Talk a minute about creativity, especially because we're out here at DevNet Create. So I love this quote: "You can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have." And this is something that I, I deeply believe. And I also know, and I and we know as a DevNet community that when you're building something new, when you are starting a project that's maybe just a personal side project, or even if it's something really big, a big transformation you're leading at work, a big new project. You t it takes lots of little sparks of inspiration. Lots of inputs helps bring creativity. And so that is why today we are bringing you the DevNet Demo Jam. So this is our first DevNet Demo Jam. And um, we are going to be featuring a number of the advocates and people from the, the DevNet team. And we're going to just do some rapid fire demos to help you charge you up with a lot of ideas about things that you might be able to do. And Mo all the code that you're going to see is available in Code Exchange. So these are projects that you can then go find and try and build some things related to yourself. All right, and we are just going to get started. We're going to start with Stev. So Stev is here all the way from France, and um, he's going to show us some an interesting project he built with Meraki. All right. Thanks, Thanks Mandy. Then yeah, um, I I'm also a dad. Okay, <laughs> I work, but I'm here as a dad today. And any of those? Yeah, I guess, yeah. quite a lot of us. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Then I've been in this situation when I, my oldest just joined sixth grade. And you know, they, they go alone to school. It's not like you're yeah. taking them there. It's yeah. scary when they're, they start doing things more on their own. Yeah, I have middle schoolers too. We were walking that path. And, yeah. and when the kid was coming home with the bus, she would just say, hey, can you call your mom? And then say, hey, 
you forgot to call mum. Right. <laughs> and then it was like, okay. And after a few months, I was like, oh, but I'm a developer. I can solve real technical worldwide challenges. <laughs> That's one for my family. Then I came up with this idea with Jean, which, which was really Jenny, you can call it in US language, <laughs> that was really willing to help her more than. And let's do a quick demo. Then basically she would join home as she has a phone, just the Wi-Fi will get just turned on. And I'm joining now the network, three, two, one. The network is named Mira Kids. I think that was visionary for the Mira Kids. <laughs> <laughs> then basically, you know those access points. I had one at home. I was playing with those API. Then I said, OK, the API is provided, and it goes with a webhook to my application. And then I push a message to Webex Teams. Okay. And how do you build that? We saw a bit of the dashboard yesterday. You just put a webhook URL in there. And from the webhook, you will get a notification. And what you get on the notification is a JSON payload. And everybody does JSON, OK? And in there, you get a client MAC address. And good news, I know my oldest MAC address of a phone. Then I can track that and say, hey, this is a time where she just joined the network. There's an extra stuff you need to do is that you don't get a notification when someone leaves. Then that's what I needed to track in memory. And then I also said, hey, but what happens on weekends? I don't want to know when someone gives. And then I said, OK, I need now to do some timeouts, but not on weekends. And then, what is it? It's Chrome. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, then I said, OK, what about the Chrome module? And I think that's good. If you do some Node.js coding, there's a Chrome module. And it helps a lot. You don't have to play too much with, with um, and we all know about Chrome. Then I, I put it there. And, and then, uh, very short, what do you see? Hey, look, look at that. Good news. So she got home. She joined. She got home, OK. Just but brought, she's here. Just brought her phone right to US from France. <laughs> What's she doing without her phone? What's a teenager without her phone? Yeah. <laughs> they can't leave. And then yeah. I'm now thinking, maybe I shouldn't give her 4G or 5G. Because yeah. uh, she will need to be just wired to my Wi-Fi network. Go. So have you, thought about <laughs> have you thought about ways to extend? Yeah. I'm thinking like. Not now yet, but I'm thinking in a few years from now, we should start thinking of it. If I, if I start seeing some recurring MAC address so joining my MAC network. MAC address showing up very frequently. Over and over, like at night or after school maybe when I'm not there. that's a boyfriend or nah, something? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe I will go there. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you, Seb. And yeah, tell us about the other uh, resources to help build this. Yeah. Just go to Code Exchange, you type Miraki, you've got a lot of resources there, and you'll find the code. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Next up, we've got Jeff Levensailer. So, Jeff was a DevNet Creator Award winner last year. And so, since he was a Creator Award winner, I asked him to come up and show um, some things that he's also been covering in a workshop this week. Um, so, Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself and about the project. Yep, Jeff Levensailer, I'm a collaboration engineer who's kind of made the leap into development in the last uh, year or so, and thanks to DevNet. And I just wanted to talk about the final solution to a workshop we did, how to teach an old prog new tricks. I love the name. It's if good. you like puns, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> so the, what we built, for those in the workshop yesterday, they already know, but Doggo. So Doggo is man or admin's best friend. <laughs> Doggo understands human, so you can talk to it like a human being. You don't have to uh, do the verb noun approach to like a normal bot. So it's conversational. Just yeah, it's like, conversational. Yeah. It uses dialogue flow as a front end. Cool. Uh, it's had lots of training, but it could always use more. So there's always things it misses, and you go back and, and map those misutterances to intents. It fetches, and it brings back to human. So fetch <laughs> against the old uh, call manager, Axel, Riz, log collection, those SOAP APIs. And plenty more puns. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've done this bot uh, a lot, the, the conversational piece I've added just for this workshop. But the bot was created with a real use case in mind, and that is dial plan management. So I had a cutover that was a rolling cut. Every Friday was a cutover. Every Monday was support. Towards the end of this six-month process of cutting this customer over, they were asking me for new hires. They needed numbers. So what I did was uh, put it in a bot. So I need three DIDs for Los Angeles. And it spits out the next three DIDs available. Now how this works is based on a CSV spreadsheet of all the numbers that they have with the city, area code, and DID. So you can ask by area code if you want. And use a WebEx Teams bot to uh, 
uh, go to Dialogflow, it parses that request into an intent, and then it uses a custom Python uh, script using some middleware I wrote to look up the CSV file and then do an Axle request. So this uses so Axle. I really, this is a great example because it's something that you were, it was a repetitive kind of thing. You were getting asked for a lot, like I need yep. three more numbers, I need three more numbers, and um, or I need 100 more numbers. Um, and so you were able to use automation with you know the, the Axle APIs. Those have been around for a while and are really powerful and lots of people have used them. But this is a completely new way to use them, like integrating them with the spot. Yep, connecting the old to the new is what this whole workshop was about and it's very what cool. we're trying to do here. And really, it, I use WebEx Teams as a conduit for this cutover. I had 50 different offices and I had contextual information. So in each office, I was only talking to the people that needed to know that information. When somebody asked me a question, I knew exactly what office they were coming from. So that was real important. But when they asked for a new number, I would have to go in their WebEx team space and grab a PDF with the numbers, and every number had a different format. So I asked the carrier, because we were actually combining to a single carrier too, to give me all the numbers. So, and then I automated it. Very well. The next one I'll talk about is uh, log collection. A lot of people don't even know Call Manager has a log collection API. So I need Tomcat logs for the last 15 minutes. What this does is it goes out and asks uh, call manager to send the logs over to an SFTP server. And that's what this looks like right here. Uh, it, the SFTP server is also an S3 bucket that kicks off a Lambda script. Uh, and that Lambda script reads from a dyno database that all it is is a cache of the last room ID and token for that request. And then it sends the logs to WebEx Teams. Excellent. That's really handy too. I spent some time early in my career collecting a lot of logs, and this would be super yeah, handy. If, if you work with collaboration uh, call manager, each version has a different version of RTMT. RTMT is an old Java application, so you have to have the right version of Java. So this helps in not having to log in or have the right version of any dependencies. You just ask the bot and get the logs back. And you could even take this a step further and say, send the logs to tech. Very cool, very cool. <clears throat> uh, the next one I'll talk about is uh, real-time information service. So I need to know if a phone is registered. It'll go out and uh, first it looks up for that username because we're not asking it for a number, we're asking it first and last name. It finds out from the phone number of that user and then now it has the phone number. It does a actual request for the phone and then it uses Riz to actually go and see the last time that phone is registered. And that link right there is a link to the web interface of the phone so you can manage it from WebEx Teams without logging in and finding that information. And that's how this works. So WebEx Teams, Dialogflow, Python, to Cisco Riz. Cool, very nice. You can scrape the interface of the phone. So what this does is go to the interface of the phone, uses a library called Beautiful Soup, and then serializes that to grab the information such as you know, the TFTP server that that's reading from. So a lot of that uh, doing big migrations, you have those DHCP options, you might forget one or two and that's not coming over, you can tell why. Just real quick, uh, some other things we could do. Ask for a screenshot. This uses uh, CTI to go to the web interface of the phone again. Very nice. Resetting a pin of a user, uh, super easy. No one ever asked for that. No. <laughs> <laughs> and all of this is available at Code Exchange. So these are all libraries I've either created or contributed to. So Cisco Axle, Cisco Riz, Log Collection. So just search for my name, Jeff Levensailor at Code Exchange, or just the name of the API you're looking for. And these are these are really excellent projects and great example of community contribution. You know, you've written wrappers for these APIs, you've made it for easier for the whole community to innovate and build. Yeah, so, so a background of these, these are SOAP APIs that came out with Call Manager 5, I think, in like 2008. And they were, it was the time with Java and .NET was king. And what DevNet's really teaching is easier coding through Python and Node.js. So having a wrapper really helps, so. Awesome, thank you so much, really appreciate it. All right. Next up, next up is Krishan Veer. He is our security advocate, and he's going to show us some interesting features with um, Cisco Threat Response and uh, how we can do some things to detect some possible malicious artifacts and things like that. Yes. Let's go for it. So um, you guys must be wondering why this guy is showing a, a UI. <laughs> uh, in, a, in a DevNet conference. But the reason I want to show this is a, a product Cisco launched threat response. It's built on top of APIs. It's built on top of publicly available APIs of Cisco security products. So like Umbrella, AMP, 
Firepower, um, WSA, ESA, all our products have amazing APIs. And this is a product which we develop on top of those APIs. And, and those so, APIs are public. Every, yes, those APIs are them, public. Like right. if I go to the modules here and I look at, um, uh, look at, look at, let's say for example, Umbrella, I'm actually communicating to Umbrella APIs. I'm putting tokens in like you would do if you are using public APIs of Umbrella. So uh, this is a, 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 a excellent product which is built on top of uh, APIs. And that's why I wanted to show you, um, now I want to show you what it can do. And so I will quickly switch, um, just in case if you don't have background in security. Um, whenever you are a security operation manager or an analyst, you are uh, trying to answer two questions. What, are the, what is a particular threat? And I have I seen that on my network. And when, when you identify a threat, you are looking for some, some artifacts, maybe a network artifact like IP or domains, or you're looking for a file artifact or a host artifact like a file SHA, right? So, uh, so, so that's your, the, the way your workflow get triggered is either you got this intelligence because your boss received the email from someone that, hey, we saw this in our network, did you see it? Or you read something on uh, Twitter, or you're reading some blogs, like Talus blogs or McAfee blogs or Symantec blogs. They're doing active research, so they're publishing this. Or there is somebody in your network who created a case because they saw something, and that triggers the workflow. Or the third one is that you have these firewalls in your network, you have uh, NetFlow data which is coming through StealthWatch or AMP from your endpoint solution, they are triggering something that something bad has happened, some event has executed, so that triggers the workflow. And then you try to answer these two questions. So this is where- The two questions were, is uh, it bad? Yes. <laughs> and is it on my network? As, have you seen okay. it on my network? Right. So this is where the NetFlow, this is where this comes into the play really well, um, uh, the threat response. So let's say for example, um, I got these observables, uh, and so I just type in, I just copy and paste. So you could see there is a domain here, yep. and there is a file shop, this big junk, and there is a bunch of other junks here. So I just press investigate and try to answer those two questions, right? So what happened underneath what this did, it actually went to ThreatGrid using the ThreatGrid APIs, the tool, and try to find out, ThreatGrid is our sandboxing solution, so where we can explore the sample and see what, what its behavior is. And Umbrella is our, uh, uh, has an investigate database where we actually look at uh, multiple um, domain lookups which are happening, whether, and then we give disposition on those domains, whether they're safe or they're malicious. All right, so, so, so it did two things, so we could see if I scroll down, what it did is that it looked at this SHA, so two observables, one is the SHA, the other one is domain, and now I can look at this, this is the SHA, and I want to, so first question is answered, this is bad. The second question, have you seen this on my network? So it looks like there is a target. So this PC is, is one, has seen that, or, or sorry, this is the endpoint which has seen that. Right, so I have an endpoint on which that, that particular file was seen. So I've got answer to both the questions. So now if I quickly look at my um, uh, a second, uh, observable, which is domain, and so um, let's see, this is a malicious domain, and uh, does anyone has seen it? Yes, there was a Cisco SC iPhone which has actually accessed this, right? <laughs> so, so another thing which you can do from here is that, okay, I detected, I investigated, now can I do remediation, which is very important because if we can contain threats quickly, then it's, 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 it's the best win. So over here, if I click on this domain, I can actually go to Umbrella and block this domain. So no longer anyone can actually access And this blocking also happened underneath using public APIs of Umbrella, which we call the enforcement APIs. So that's really cool. Yeah. At the beginning, you mentioned another way to find out about threats is through the research that Talos um, and other companies publish. Correct. So is there anything automated that we can do to bring in that research and then use it with this tool to investigate? Yeah, so great question, Mandy. So if you look at, this has full integration of casebooks, so you can create cases here, so which your analysts can actually look at. So one of the ways you can collect intelligence is reading these blogs. So the threat um, response uh, product itself has its own APIs. So it uses, it's built on top of APIs, it also offers APIs to create this automation of workflow. So right now I have a simple script which I wrote is, which can actually go to um, a, a, a Talos blog and actually get observables from those blogs. So in last one month, whatever Talos has published, 
in terms of threats it's seeing, it has published, it always publishes in those blogs the observables like IPs, domains, or SHAs it has seen on there. So I'm gonna just quickly execute this. So what this script is gonna do, it's gonna go get all those blogs in last one month, grab all the observables from them, put it, create cases based on that, and actually uh, notify the WebEx team room. Oh, nice. Uh, so if your team is collaborating, it will put there that, hey, I saw this, and I've created these cases. So let's uh, see if uh, it works. So it's currently reading. If Always it doesn't find any error. observables in a file, then it just doesn't create any cases. It just skips. So if I go to the WebEx Teams room, I should be able to now start seeing that it is being the case is being created. Oh, nice. So as you can see, it just adds. And then if I go to um, uh, my case book over here and I refresh, so you will start seeing that cases will be created now. So I open the case book. Um, you oh, can cool. see the cases. So it's are right there. into the workflow. Right. So, team so now the, the there's a full automation of workflow. Now, the, if I'm an analyst, I, I am in that room. I saw, okay, I have to go look at the cases. I can pick cases and start investigating them. So if I click awesome. on any one of these, I can just look at that and I can start investigating them. Fantastic. So Thank you so much. Oh, really that is already it. a malicious domain. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. So next, thank you. So next, I want to bring up um, Hank and Allison. And Hank and Allison are from our Sandbox team. Who uses the Sandbox? Anybody use the DevNet Sandbox? <laughs> oh, yeah. So if you don't know, um, the DevNet Sandbox are hosted free labs that you can reserve and get instantly hands-on with all of our DevNet platforms. So what's really cool is that we are actually using a lot of the automation techniques that we talk about in DevNet and a lot of the DevOps principles and programmability. We're using those to build the Sandbox as well. And so I invited Hank and Allison up here to talk about some projects that are really live and part of building our sandbox right now, but also demonstrate some of these principles. So Hank, start us off. Thanks, Mandy. So I am working actively right now on a major project to update the way that we build and manage the network platform that runs all of the sandboxes that you're using. So we have a live network that runs in a real data center on real infrastructure with 70,000 plus users active every day. Um, I can't just toy around with that network. My boss won't let me. <laughs> so the first step I yep. needed was a place to simulate that network so I could see what it looks like. And so I go back to a tried and true technology I talk a ton about, viral. So I modeled the entire sandbox infrastructure, the WAN, the DMZ, the internal fabric, the firewalls, everything that makes up, it's been modeled in, in viral. And then I've demoed before, but we've got our viral CLI that allows me to interact with that live as it goes through and interact with it in a net DevOps fashion. Now the project that I'm gonna really demo here is I want to take the information that's there and give me a foundation to have knowledge. And the first thing I learned as I started to apply net DevOps principles in the real world is we need a management system to know what's out there. And so NetBox is an open source DC, IM, and IPAM tool, data center infrastructure management, IP address management tool developed by the DigitalOcean folks. So fully open source, great tool for these pieces. But manually adding devices is time consuming and inaccurate. And so I, I built a tool using an open source project from Cisco called PyATS and Genie that allowed me to scan through that network simulation and then drive that data live into the NetBox solution that's there. So we're gonna let it run for a bit, and if I just go back over here and refresh now, we'll see that we're already seeing data being generated automatically into the system. Cool, so while that's populating, um, so Hank, many of you may know, just made a shift in role. Hank's been an advocate for several years in DevNet, and he's moved to the Sandbox team, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about like the focus and the approach that you're bringing to that. Yeah, absolutely, the reason that I made this switch and why I'm so excited about it is I've been talking about network automation for so long, for a couple of years with DevNet, and even a bit before that, but the questions I started getting was, this is great, Hank, in the lab, but how do I do this against a real network that has actual users where I can't just start toying around with code? So the idea in Sandbox was, well, we have a real network. How can I learn what does it take to take principles and apply it to a functional network? And then from our lessons internally, how do we skill up our team? How do we build systems that we can use and make scale go through, roll that information back out through 
events like DevNet Create, blogs, webinars, all those other pieces that go in. So continuing to give back through advocacy, but now wearing the hat of operations. And I do wear a hat of operations. My phone goes off, I have to call support. We have legitimate <laughs> users that complain. Yeah. I'm okay. back in an ops role. Awesome. So uh, do, I, oh, yeah. I so take a look at our there. So if I got? go and refresh, so we've, we've built up here. And if I go grab one of these switches here. So this didn't exist before. I learned through PyATS. We can see that it's an iOS VL2 system. We can see its primary IP address. And we can see all the interfaces that are on that device, where they're connected to, how it goes in. And what's nice is as my network changes, I can rerun this tool to update and keep my systems accurate as it goes through. Cool. Thank you very much. Excellent. So I'd like to introduce Allison. Allison is, I, I think, I'm pretty sure, the oh, newest yeah. member of the DevNet team. She's been, yeah, welcome. <laughs> She is a, she's, she joined about a month and a half ago, about a month and a half, right? Yeah, a month um, and a half. So she's also, she is from Austin, uh, as am I, and she is working on our application layer within the sandbox. So she's creating APIs and layers on top of our sandbox that we can use to make new offers and things like that. So show us, show us what you're working All right. on. Awesome. So yeah, as Mandy said, I'm the newest person, I think, at Sandbox. And so one of the things that I've been doing as I'm ramping up and like learning all the Cisco technology is going back and trying to automate some of the processes and applications that we already have in the back end on Sandbox. So what I have here, um, this is a video because I didn't want to actually like rip down and rebuild my entire prod server um, <laughs> in a good. demo. It takes about 10 minutes anyways. Um, but what I have here is a Terraform script as well as an Ansible script that will go out, provision a virtual machine, and do all the configurations I need to run a full stack application. So I have one command here, and this script just goes out and does everything. It's like magic. So I'm running Postgres, Redis, um, a Python application, Nginx, and then all the SSL and systemd server stuff. All of that is being done automatically for me. So I can just go and like get tea or something, and I come back, and I have a production server running. It's really awesome. Excellent. <laughs> One thing I really like about that, so it's you're using Ansible and Terraform, and those are, um, you know, tools that we talk about with the DevNet community and a lot of people are trying to learn, and we actually use those to build yeah. our sandbox as well. It's, it's so. such a time saver for me, because I like this normally would take like multiple hours, and like then you have to worry about, oh, did I spell this the same way that I did it last time? This way I know every single time I build my infrastructure, it's the exact same, and it's version controlled as well, so I can push all this up to Git, and I can iterate on that, and it's so much better than having to do it all manually. Awesome. Thank you so right. much. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. So in that, same, in that same vein of DevNet tools that we're building that we can share with you, um, I invited Anne to come up and talk about how we build our developer documentation. So developer documentation, really important for using APIs. And we put a lot of value on it. And we actually use a docs-like code mentality. So we build our documentation in GitHub. And we use pull requests to manage it. And, um, Anne has been working on this and how we bring this into DevNet, and our platform team has built some amazing things around it. So I just wanted to take a minute to talk about that and also share some ideas that you can actually use to do a similar workflow. Exactly. So yeah, I'm here, and I, I also wrote a book about this. I'm so excited about these techniques, right? So let's, let's go ahead and give it a shot. So anybody here, as long as you have a free GitHub account, you can try this. You can even play along right now if you want. You basically just make a GitHub repository. And then what's going on in the background, just to make sure you know, is that Jekyll, which is a static site generator, is building the site. There's a webhook provided by GitHub Pages. And then um, you're basically doing continuous integration, continuous deployment for documentation. That's the cool part, right? So I'm going to do a quick demo on my GitHub account. And all you have to do is create a repository. I even used the crazy name they gave me. And then you always want to read me. I think that's best practice, as well as a license. So make sure people know how you, they can reuse your stuff. And this is literally less than a minute. I didn't even speed it up. So the I'm real time this video. This is real time. <laughs> I'm going to hit the settings and go down to GitHub Pages. Once I'm on GitHub Pages, I'm going to go ahead and make it so that anytime I push to the master branch, I'm going to get an entirely new website. So that's my URL. And I can do custom URLs if I want. I can pick a Jekyll theme right through their UI and then just push to master. That's all you have to do. And so this lets me have a brand new website with the URL they gave me, github.io. Take a look. It's already deployed. There nice. we go. So, so 
How does that relate yeah, to so our DevNet flow? This is a very simple flow because I push directly to master, but we actually like to do pull requests for our documentation, then we can review each other's stuff. And one of the ways that we do this is actually in DevNet Learning Labs. So DevNet Learning Labs are actually built from GitHub with Markdown, very simple. A JSON file glues it all together. Um, and then you can see the rendering on GitHub itself, but then we go ahead and publish it in the way that we want it rendered, right? So tutorial style, you get step one, step two, we integrate it with our sandbox, like all these things didn't happen automatically for us and we can focus on right, 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 so. Excellent, yes. great, so I think this is a really great message to just bring this mindset of docs like code into your work and also to know that it's really easy to stand up a website if you're building a project and you wanna create some documentation, you can check out Anne's workshop and, yes. and learn how to do that. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So, awesome. I forgot to mention um, on Hank's demo, the code that he showed is also available in Code Exchange. So, if you want to try out any of that automation, that is available. And you can run it on Sandbox. That's very meta. Um, Sandbox. <laughs> All right. So, I want to bring up Adrian. Adrian is an engineer on our co creations team, the co creations team in DevNet builds really interesting projects with customers and partners and investigates a lot of new ideas. And he is going to show us um, a project he built using Cisco SDN-WAN. Cool. Thanks, Mandy. Uh, hello, everybody. So this specific co-creations, we started working on it because our friends from Brazil, are you guys out there? Yeah. Yeah, there they are. So <laughs> Brazil, right, yeah. So. Um, they came up with a request from, uh, from some of the customers in which they wanted to have a uh, <clears throat> unified interface for the vManage single tenant instances that they had. So for uh, different reasons, they decided not to go with the multi-tenant uh, solution from SD-WAN, uh, but with single tenants. So currently, I mean, before this project, there was nothing out there for people that have single tenant instances of their SD-WAN fabrics to have one single view of all their tenants, right? So what we've done uh, is we've built that based on the vManage REST APIs. We've built a simple application uh, using the API. Architecturally, is very simple. It's just a user dashboard. The front end is in React, uh, Open API backend, Swagger, and then the backend acts like a wrapper interacting with the vManage REST APIs for all the single tenants that you want to have monitored with this. Uh, so everything API. you built underneath it, you're using the, the vManage APIs, and then you've built this, this dashboard view on top of it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Let's yeah. see it. So let's have a look at it. Um, and show. So I have it right here. This is how it looks. Uh, if you guys are familiar with the multi-tenant view, it's very similar, so we were inspired by that in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so I have here already a tenant. This is a vManage instance that's running in our DMZ in San Jose, and uh, I'm just gonna add one more. I'm gonna call it create 2019. I'm gonna paste in the IP. And here you can, of course, specify username and password, change ports if you have it listening on a different port. Um, and add tenant, and if everything works well, there we go. All right. So you see here critical statistics about the control plane status, the site health for all of them, uh, WAN edge health, and also the vSmart. So, so all of this information is coming through the vManage APIs. You're able to pull it in and, and display. Exactly, yeah. And then if you click this, you get more statistics, how many uh, devices the control plane is up, uh, site health for all of them. Right, and then also if I click on the actual tenant, it opens up that instance of vManage, and nice. if I notice a problem in my dashboard, I come here and I address it, right? Awesome. So if somebody wants to build something similar to this or learn how to use the vManage APIs, where can they go? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. We have a bunch of content, actually, on uh, developer.cisco.com slash sdwen. We have Learning Labs, we have this app that you can download, it's all Dockerized. I'm running it on my local laptop, but you can have it running on a web server. Uh, it's out there to be downloaded. It's in Code Add Exchange. features, Code Exchange, yes. Um, so, what right? else? We have a video course. Oh, video too. course, yeah. Yes. <laughs> video course, Learning Labs, Code Exchange, Ecosystem Exchange, I mean, you name it, developer.cisco.com slash sdwen. And awesome. my buddy over there, Stuart, also a co big contributor. 
I uh, just want to recognize him. Um, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, Adrian. That was great. Thank you. All right. So yesterday in the day one keynote, we saw a short video about doing some object classification using machine learning in the browser. And um, I thought that that deserved a little bit deeper look about what's going on and, and how you build something like that. So um, I'm excited to have Abu here to take us through that. He's been working on that project, and he's going to show us some more of, of how he built it. All right, go for it. Yeah, thank you, Mandy, for having me. So today I will show you the machine learning in the browser. So most of the time when people are talking about machine learning, they talk about really complicated algorithms, the expensive devices, or how you should build your model. So all these things make it really difficult for us to start learning the machine learning. But with the TensorFlow.js, uh, the whole learning become way really easier. I will show you in a bit. So do you remember when we first uh, start learning the API, we start from how to make an API call, right. not to build an API. Right. So the same thing we can apply to the machine learning, like uh, we can start from performing a prediction from pre-trained model, not start from let's train a model. So we don't, we, don't have to train, we don't have to start out training our own models. We can use models that exist. Yes, okay. exactly. And also you can see with the TensorFlow.js, with a pre-trained model, we can perform the image classification in just five lines of code. Five lines of code. Yeah, that is that cool it is. That's very cool. Yeah. And that TensorFlow.js is a, is a perfect uh, start kit for you if you want to learn machine learning because there's no installation. You don't need a driver. It can run on Windows, Mac, even on your phone. It can run on the, oh. all different type of uh, graphic cards. Excellent. I think that's really cool that you can run it on your phone. And then as inputs, you can use the camera, the microphone, you know, all the onboard um, devices that you have as part of your phone. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, that's a cool part. So you can see the, the image on the, on the screen. So that is a poster recognition. So literally, you can use your laptop with a webcam on it. Just with a few lines of code, you can do that fun uh, video out of it. Very cool. Yeah, and another cool part is uh, once uh, during the full uh, fun learning journey, you will start familiar with the concept, the flow, and all the APIs. Once it's ready, you can switch to the tensor, actual TensorFlow library because 90% of the API is very similar to the TensorFlow. Okay. So it's a perfect start kit for, for you. So for today's demo, we, we will use Meraki MV camera, the snapshot API. We will take a snapshot and uh, do uh, perform the object detection out of the snapshot. So this is the same Meraki camera that we saw yesterday at the end of the keynote where we took a picture of everyone out in the audience. Um, we're using that same API uh, and the same camera for this. Yeah, so this is a small state we set up. So we have static object that green key, and then we have another screen playing our video clips. In the, in the video clip, you can see there's the people, there's the cars, there's the kid, dogs, the balloons. So we will try to uh, oh, detect all the objects. So this is a demo we're gonna show. Let's refresh. And at the right side, you can see we will start down using a model. The model is pre-trained by the community. You don't need to pay for it. You even don't need to host it. Just to download the image. And after we download the, sorry, the module, after we download the module, we will try to fetch the image and do the recognition. So, so the, green, the green box is showing like a found an object, and then it says bottle, and it has like a number. And that's showing, that number is the confidence. Yes. So it's, I'm 70% sure this is a bottle. Yeah, so, sorry. That's OK. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if, we, if you look at the code, the actual code, is we just need a full line of code to perform the object detection. Wow. That is really simple. And the even cooler part is that we open source this in our code exchange. So literally, you can download it and start the machine learning journey right now. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. And uh, last but not least, uh, I'd like to welcome John McDonough to the stage. John is a developer advocate. He focuses on data center, automation, UCS. Let's see what you've built. All right, so I'll show you what I built. I built a, um, a VS Code to GitHub, to AWS, to Ansible, to UCS automation. So when I commit my um, Ansible playbook up to GitHub, it automatically applies it to my UCS. And so what I do in my playbook, We'll make a change. I'm just going to say these VLANs that are currently not there, we'll put them there. And I'll prove that they're not there. They're not there, right? <laughs> and I'm going to change this to present. 
And I will go ahead and once the file auto saves, I'll add it and I'll say. So you're making the change to the code. I'm making the change to the code. Committing it. Committing pushing it. Pushing it to GitHub. Uh, add VLANs and I commit that. Always put a commit message. Always put a commit message, a meaningful commit message. <laughs> 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 and then I push it and let's come over here and watch UCS Manager and you'll see some VLANs get added super fast. Here comes number. <laughs> So I think this is a great example because VLAN is definitely a, uh, there it is, yeah. It's definitely a, um, a common task that people, that you have to do to manage. And All this the time. is great to show, you know, how you can automate that and make it more repeatable and less repetitive because you're, right. you're automating it. So. We're automating it. So I heard you also have one other thing to show us. Well, you saw those things I just had to type. I'm very, very not, you know, into typing that stuff. So what I did was I created something where I could provision a server at the push of a button. At the push of a button? The push of a button. What a kind DevNet of button? IoT button. A DevNet All IoT right. button. All right. Now I could push the button. You could push the button. I think we should get them to push the button. So I want to have somebody from the crowd push the button. But hold on. This isn't a hand raising thing, and I'm doing something that not it's very non technical. Okay. You know, we all have hobbies other than tech stuff, right? Yes. So I've been practicing being a mentalist. I did not know that. <laughs> if, okay. you were, if you were a mentalist, you would have known. Uh, that's true. That's okay. true. Good point. So I'm practicing being a mentalist. So I'm going to close my eyes, and I want people in the crowd here to think about pushing the button. And okay. I'll know it. You'll know who I'll wants know to it. push the button? There'll, there'll be, be like a sign There'll be a sign. Okay. There'll be something I'll be able to tell. So okay. close my eyes. Think okay. hard. Think hard if you want to push the button. Think hard. Think really hard. I th I'm sensing like one or two things happen. Um, there's, I think, a lot of people that want to push the button. No. One no? Or two. Just one or two? Uh, I, I think, look? I think you should look. Yeah. I think there's been a sign. <laughs> <laughs> All, right, All right. Let's find someone to push the button. So All right. Push the button. It's very technical, this button push, so I have to look for a very technical button pusher. <laughs> um, Nobody that I know that works for me because no, not a plant. <laughs> this guy over here, he's not lit up. That's the one I was looking for, the not okay, lit up one. Okay, there you go. All right. So I need you to push that button. Just push it one time. And let's watch up there to see a service profile be created and a server to start provisioning. You did it. Whoa, nice. Was that clap for me or the button push? The button push, yeah. <laughs> so I can create more and more. Wow. But then when I don't want them, I just double click. And they're, and gone. they're gone. Wow, fantastic. All Thank right. you very much. All right, I'd like to get everyone up. Thank you, everyone. Um, if all the presenters come back to the stage really quick, really fast. And we have our demo jam music. Run, run, run. All right, just a big thank you to everyone. Oh, gosh. And uh, it's a lot of work to prepare these demos, and it takes a lot of courage to do an on-stage demo. So just thank you to everyone, and thank you. All right. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Susie. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, we have something new that we're adding into the schedule. Um, so, uh, you know, we talked about, we need more women in tech. There's some good women in tech, right? There's women out there, we need to get more in our workforce and everything like that. We actually have uh, a couple of groups that have actually made an effort to get some women into their workforce and to bring some to DevNet Create. So uh, let me see, where's my Verizon woman? Come on, come on stage, come on. <laughs> and now uh, the next group might get ready because they don't know they're coming up. So, uh, so You've seen them around, right? They've been around. You guys have been around the conference, quiet, young. 
excited, bright, brilliant woman. I had a chance to talk to them last night, and basically we've been teamed up with Verizon, uh, who's been, you know, the solutions architect team. A woman named Debica is the uh, senior vice president over there for the solutions architects. And she brought this great group of women over. And I want you to each introduce yourselves and talk about something that you've learned here at Create. All right. My name is Eunice Alade. And so far, the, my favorite part has been just seeing the application of all these great APIs. We had a chance to take DevNet training uh, from the developer evangelist. And it's great to see how they have been applied to several parts of uh, technology. So my favorite part has been natural language processing. Wow. My <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Kat Gabay. Um, I'm also on the Associate Solution Architect team. We're based in Cary, North Carolina. And my favorite part about DevNet so far are the connections that I've made, specifically the women who um, have come up to us and told us how important diversity is in the workforce and to go after what you truly want to do in technology. Um, I also enjoyed the Wi-Fi 6 design thinking booth. Um, so if you haven't <laughs> stopped by there yesterday, now's your chance to go. Hello, everyone. My name is Jordan Maddox. Um, my favorite part about DevNet so far has just been seeing all the applications of all these APIs that you guys are developing. Um, I come from a software engineering background, so seeing all the potential applications of everything that we've been talking about um, yesterday and going on to today is just very exciting for me to see how far we can go into the future. Excellent. Hello, everyone. My name is Janine. Um, I, I really have to say I really like this DevNet conference and seeing so many people I'm so passionate about technology coming together. Um, I actually attended a workshop yesterday about uh, how to create an indoor, uh, indoor mapping system with Cisco Meraki, and that's actually something I did for my senior design. So I think that's really interesting in how we can um, use technology to help people because my senior design project is about how to um, develop an indoor mapping system for uh, visually impaired people to guide them navigate in the in indoor um, space. So I think it's a great, uh, experience so far, meeting so many uh, new people, and um, everyone's been very helpful. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Excellent. And I want you guys, you talked about the Verizon Solutions Architect Associates program. Can one of you talk about that? Sure. Um, so uh, the Associate SA, uh, uh, Associate SA program, it's a team of 11 people. Uh, we are uh, all part of the team. Um, we are in, it's, it's an early in career program. Uh, where we we get trained on various skills that's required to become a field SA. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I, I personally have learned so much in this program, and I really appreciate people that um, Verizon, um, peop that the people in Verizon that put this program together for us to grow. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay, and next up, are my, are my Presidio women here? Yeah? Come on. <laughs> they don't know they're coming up, so. <laughs> All right, so another, another great group, and uh, you know that Maybelline. <laughs> won our DevNet Creator Award for all of the work that she's doing, but why don't you each like quickly introduce yourselves and uh, what you're learning here. My name is Maybelline Plechic. I'm an engineering manager for Presidio, and I'm just excited to be here. And I know you've seen me on stage enough, so I will let the rest of the group do the talking. <laughs> My name is Jackie Warshauer. I'm a UC engineer for Presidio, and I'm learning that I love to code. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. And also, the hackathon was a great time because we got to work together in teams and uh, spend a lot of time collaborating with others. Excellent. My name is Kim Scott, and I'm an engineering manager for Presidio as well. And this was my first DevNet. I enjoyed myself. I loved Camp Create, and I can't wait to take it back home to my team and get it started. Um, hi, I'm Anu. I'm a managing consultant for collaboration at Presidio. This is my second time at DevNet Create, and I did Camp Create this time, and I had an awesome time working with my Camp Create team, coming up with a facial recognition app for to keep predators from school. So I'm I was excited about the project, and I really want. To. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, so we're really looking to scale that and make it a, a you know, really big project. So I'm excited about that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mabel, and I'm not going to let you get off the hook. Why don't you tell them about the, the weekly coding that you're doing within Presidio? Oh, yeah. So I do two different weekly codings a week. So one is the for the women uh, study group. A lot of them are already attending here. I have a few that are sitting back there. Uh, the goal is to get them more comfortable, more confident. I know that it's very intimidating, especially for women. It's not easy. It takes a lot of bravery to stand out and step up and really just own it, right? Um, even, it doesn't matter where you come from. You got to make it a fun experience. It's easier to learn more together, not by yourself. And that's what we're trying to promote. And the same thing what we do with the guys as well. We have the secure networks, we have data center collaboration teams. So Jeff has been an awesome mentor. I have Brad Haas, I have Paul Gub uh, Giblin. I have, I have so many resources from mentors that are all men as well. So I'm very, very happy and very honored to put for all that support. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, Pete and Sarah, what do you think about coming on stage for a minute? Uh, come on. <laughs> no, I didn't tell them in advance. So, so Pete has brought his daughter to DevNet Create. So why don't you talk a little bit about your journey? Sure. Thank you, Susie. <laughs> so uh, last year, I was fortunate enough to take part in Camp Create. And when I got home, I was telling my kids about it. I have five daughters, actually. And Sarah here, she was really interested in it. And I promised her that if she helped me document an open source project I was working on, then she could come this year. And, uh, and she's been helping me out. So I had to pony up and uh, bring her with me. So, um. Excellent. Sarah, do you want to say anything? Would you like to just introduce yourself? So what was, what was the highlight of the trip for you so far? Was it? Maybe something downstairs, or? Um, so I feel like the highlight of the trip so far is just how amazingly diverse uh, DevNet is and just how welcoming it is. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for being brave and coming up. Excellent. OK, so I just wanted to share a few of the amazing things that are going on here. And I want you all to be thinking about how to go back into your companies, how to help the women around you, how to well, you know, help the underrepresented minorities, really help everybody around. Because we know that developing, you know, working in your careers, your jobs, it really is about that inclusiveness. It's really about learning new skills and encouraging and helping each other. So, uh, so let's carry that practice forward. OK, great. Thank you. All right, Mandy, let's go on to the next part. OK, so next is when we're going to turn it over to you guys. And you're going to actually get to um, break into groups and discuss. So yesterday, we mentioned in the keynote, hey, you can go suggest topics that you'd like to talk about with the DevNet Create community. And we kind of grouped similar topics. We had a lot of submissions. We grouped similar topics together. And it kind of sorted out to these five main different topics. So one, um, career paths, like discussing possible career paths, how you get started on career paths, anything you want to do around that. So that's going to be group one. It'll be in that far corner over there. Group two, we had a lot of questions about bringing APIs into sales conversations. Um, and that's going to be group two in the far corner over here. Group three is around massive, big, large scale IoT use cases. That's going to be right in the middle. And then group four, we had several around, we've been talking about learning a lot of new skills and new thought patterns. And so how do you create time in your busy, busy life to plan and think and learn. And so just a discussion around like different techniques you may have about how you are doing that, or if you're doing study groups or things like that. So that's going to be group four. And then group five is around brainstorming uh, use cases for specific industries. So if there's verticals you're interested in, or use cases you want to discuss, or you want to get some ideas, that's going to be group four over here. So this is completely open. You just go to the group you're interested in. Also, if you sit down and you're not into it, feel free to switch groups. You are not stuck. You can use your own feet and choose where you want to go. Um, we are going to have easels and stickies, and you can take notes and have a discussion. 
We need each group to nominate one representative who's going to give a really quick two-minute readout at the end just to share the main points that came up during the discussion so everyone gets to hear a little bit about each group. So we're going to put up a timer on um, the clock. We're going to spend 25 minutes in discussion and then come back and do those readouts. So find your person who wants to do the readout. At the end of the 25 minutes, we'll give a signal. Everybody come back together, and all those five people who will read out come towards the stage. All right? Enjoy. Have fun. Head to your corners. We'll leave this slide up so you guys can see where they are.
Hello. I uh, just wanted to give a shout out. We've got about three minutes left of discussion. So start getting your representative ready, pulling together what you want to share. You've got about three minutes to finish up. All right. Thank you, guys. So it's time to make your way back to your seats. Um, you'll notice that you're blinking. So start making your way back to your seats. Thank you. And send your representative to the front. Send the person who's going to talk from your group up here. And we'll have them line up over here on this side. All right. All right, guys, let's start. Start coming back. Send your, send your representative over here to this side of the stage. Line up. Awesome. You're going to do number one? All right, perfect. Okay.
I, I can hold your papers for you if you want. All right. All right, you've got two minutes. I've got two minutes on the clock. We've got to keep it short so all the groups can make and share. I love Mike. Yeah, you're good. So I can speak for hours, though. <laughs> <laughs> so this is for uh, group one, which focused on career paths. So introduce who you are and where you work, yeah. and then take us through. My name is Faisal Ali. I'm part of the unified communications team at LinkedIn. We build the infrastructure operations uh, and all sorts of things at LinkedIn. So I have gone through this journey of a million minutes to, like, I think, hundreds of millions of minutes of video conferencing. And uh, we are the evangelist of video on culture at LinkedIn. Why they sent me is because they thought LinkedIn connects uh, talent to the opportunity. There's nothing other better platform than LinkedIn, so that's why I'm representing. Excellent. So what we discussed about the major problem, uh, a lot of folks uh, told me that, uh, you know, they are spending like uh, thousands and thousands of dollars on the traditional education, which is the biggest challenge right now. We discussed $26 billion as the debt for you know, probably U.S. colleges. And in all honesty, most of the folks were like concerned that they are spending too much on the college education, which is not giving them the real skills. Uh, so we discussed that, uh, you know, the best course of action is maybe if you are not, don't want your kids to spend a lot of time in the traditional education, why don't give them the skills? We at LinkedIn have a day called In Day once a month where we bring the college minority uh, folks as well as uh, folks from underserved community and we try to educate them, learn, give them the skills. Teaching them to build a LinkedIn profile by itself is a skill, right? Which a lot of us who are in professional industry for 15, 20 years don't know. So try to build those skills. I have a lot to uh, say. I love the mic and I have just 30 seconds. <laughs> All right, one thing. Uh, one quick thing. Oh, one skill gap. Anybody knows what's the what's one main skill which is missing uh, missing in the world? Most needed skill. A lot of you in here with software, right? Most in demand skill. Empathy. Em empathy. Good compassion. One. What else? Communication. Communication. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the biggest biggest challenge is people think software, 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 software development is the skill. No, the biggest skill gap here is communication. Uh, you know, uh, the data, clear data shows that program management, project management, talking to people, deciphering those technical challenges into a more, uh, you know, more uh, human words is a, a big challenge. Writing proper email communication, talking into different forums is a big challenge. So I personally would recommend focus on the communication as well as, as, well as there are a lot of side jobs in the technical industries. I have so many women in tech who are like, I don't want to get into coding. That's fine. We male allies can help in the coding, but in addition to that, just try to build the skills around soft, soft skills or communication. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Group two. Where's my group two representative? So group two was how to talk about APIs in sales. All right. Introduce yourself and where you're from. Hello. My name is Octavio Diaz, Cisco. Uh, Mexico, uh, we're just going to say three letters, okay. R-O-I, ah. that's it, uh, <laughs> return on investment. We come up with three major uh, things to, to tell you. One is shift from technology and infrastructure to solutions. No? I mean, talking about with C-levels, about business outcomes, see what the technology can do for them in order to improve their processes and, 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 and their business outcome, no? Um, uh, obviously, reducing risks, no? Having, uh, empowering their engineering departments, no? In order to, to develop things. Focus on, on business outcomes, as I was saying. Scale, no? Yeah. Efficiency on, you don't have to build everything uh, every time, you have to, uh, you, you can come up with reuse of what you have you developed. And very, very important is refine and iterate. Always having this uh, uh, learn and then, uh, and then perform. And again, no? yeah. The business architecture. So I thought this was an interesting topic because um, it, sh it came up on our suggestions. And I had also heard it in several conversations throughout the week because I heard a lot of you as developers asking, you know, we want to connect in 
the work that we're doing as developers more strongly to the business message. Okay. And I think this is how this question for this group kind of came together. So thank you guys. I think you did a great job of connecting that together. Thank you. <laughs> Here, I'll take the mic. All right, group three, group three. Massive, large scale IoT use cases. All right, introduce yourself and, and tell us about what your group talked about. Okay, great. Uh, so, hi everyone, my name is Ayman Sadiq. I'm uh, from uh, IP Magix and uh, I work it with my colleague here, she's shining. <laughs> Don't hide. <laughs> hi, I'm, I'm Katie, I work at Cisco. <laughs> okay. Here, right. I'll hold it so, with you. Uh, basically, okay. with the group, uh, group three, we were actually we were uh, discussing how we can use uh, the uh, IoT uh, in a larger scale. And we came up actually with certain structure that we usually should think of when we try to apply this model. So we're going to mention first uh, what could be like right now stopping the customers uh, at a larger scale for applying the IoT uh, models. And that could be something related to, for example, uh, the... Uh, cost involving changing the existing whatever light sensors or uh, temperature or something to be smart ones so that we can actually collect the data from it. So the cost of actually uh, uh, the changing the uh, cost of transition over here. Another one that could be also related to the challenges that could be stopping customers from applying IoT on a larger scale is actually the skill set of the people to manage and adopt these kind of solutions. In uh, addition to the ability to integrate the different systems like the uh, gate controls, the motion controls, the uh, tra traffic controls and so forth to be integrated together in a model that can work in something like a smart city or something. Now, in addition to the uh, sort of set of challenges that could be facing the people today, also the security uh, fears about sharing that lots of data uh, to cloud for being processed and analyzed and generating that, the, the reports and analytics. That's also uh, the fear from the customer side. Are my data or will my data actually be uh, shared uh, in, in a good way or in a secured way? Now, uh, the, the, the use cases that we thought about is the applying the IoT in something like uh, smart cities, uh, something related, for example, to the transportation, knowing where your vehicles are going and so forth, uh, to something also related to the uh, fulfillment of uh, inventory, like the Amazon-style kind of shipping and finding the packages and so forth. And when we thought about the different use cases, also we thought about what could be the right model to design such uh, IoT large-scale system. And that involved the uh, um, first picking the right type of sensors, whether it's the motion sensors, uh, light sensors, heat sensors, and so forth. Uh, and connecting it with the right gateway to a storage that can either be uh, deployed centralized or uh, uh, in a distributed model so we can collect and store this data in the right way to be available for the processing and generating the right set of analytics and reports for this. Now, all of this actually should be uh, governed also by a security layer to make sure that the data that we, are gather, uh, that we are gathering is securely stored without being tampered or hacked or accessible uh, by unauthorized uh, uh, persons. Now, uh, uh, part of this as well, which is I think this is uh, the whole idea about IoT, is ability to manage and uh, uh, control the lights, for example, somewhere. So the manageability of the components, all of, the, all of this together, and the ability to extract and send the notifications and alerts uh, whenever something happens according to a threshold or notification alert, uh, like for crowd management and so forth. So, uh, yeah. That's, that's great. It. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent uh, drawings as well. All right, group four. So group four was about um, planning time to think and learn. So different techniques for creating space in your schedule, in your life, to think and learn. All right. Thank you, Mandy. All right, so there were some, some of the challenges we came up with were uh, anytime you start out with a task, you need, to, um, you need to know why. And knowing why you're doing the thing is obviously pretty important in the way you would uh, overcome that is outlining requirements. Um, one of the other issues that would uh, slow you down is saying you don't have, any, you don't have time, you don't have, uh, uh, you don't have an appropriate schedule set for certain tasks, and so the use of timers would really help out with that. Um, the third item that could be you know, inhibiting work is uh, gathering, gathering requirements, and one of the tools we would use for that is using Kanban boards. Um, Fourth problem is paralysis by analysis, and anytime you come across a complex problem and you don't, you know, there are 20 million ways to approach it, it, um, yeah, it might, be seem, might seem pretty daunting, but um, you can, uh, by getting with a group work group and prioritizing what and what tasks you want to do and when you want to do them, and getting the input from the work group, that can be a solution. 
And number five is lack of prioritization. And um, along the same lines, it would it often helps to discuss with the team and figure out uh, what the hot items are, what the uh, what the items are that may be blocking the customers' uh, deliveries to the customers' requirements. And and so yes, uh, scheduling and getting the team to put together a schedule and stick with that. So I listened in for a few minutes, and I, I heard context switching coming up a lot. So any thoughts that came out of it around the context switching discussion? You know, as somebody who suffers from severe ADHD, I understand context switching very well. And, <laughs> and um, yes, it can, be, it can be kind of tricky to shut off those outside influences and shut off those, um, those people coming to your desk every five minutes. And so sometimes it's as simple as putting a sign up outside your cube that says, in work in progress, okay. do not bother. And you have to establish barriers with coworkers to, to not interrupt during, you know, while you're segmenting your time off for certain tasks. Awesome, thank you guys so much. I also saw, um, oh yeah, let's clap for you first, yeah. Thank you guys. So I saw Kanban um, was on there as well. Anybody that works on my team knows I'm a big fan of Kanban. And I actually use it at home with my kids. We've got a Kanban board for chores. Um, works out really well if anybody wants to get ideas about that. All right, I will hold that for you. It's group five, use cases for specific industries. Say who you are Hi. and take yes, us through I it. Yes, I am Ryan Wolf. I had to look at my badge to make sure. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so we had to talk about use cases for different verticals or different industries. Um, the first one we kind of talked about was actually kind of branching off of uh, Stev's demo that we uh, started out with this morning um, about tracking his kids. Um, we kind of, much to my surprise, apparently there are a lot of foxes in the city of London. Um, I didn't know this. But wow. They, um, do they, what do they, like eat chickens or something like that? Was there, I don't know. There's a reason they're there, I guess. <laughs> but regardless, um, like tracking them and like seeing where they're at. Um, so that the government and the city can, you know, be aware and kind of take take action on those kind of things. But then kind of also you can expand that to like larger tracking and analysis of just groups of people. And we talk about like the casino and the cruise industries, you know, being able to track um, when people are aware and predict where they'll go next to like yeah. surge in food resources or just general um, service resources to get people ready to handle the surge. Um, the next one was actually kind of talking about uh, similar use cases for like pasta the uh, pasta workshop that's actually running, uh, I think, yesterday and today, um, just talking about using, you know, machine learning and computer vision in conjunction with like camera imaging to um, automatically and or I guess automate the QA in manufacturing or just general production. And you know, obviously that would have big impacts like bottom line and return on investment there. Um, resource inventory. Um, the, this kind of started out talking about like just using facial recognition to like get rid of the need of badging being required for like mm. as a security mechanism. So, um, which would then in in turn reduce tailgating because you can't if your face doesn't match you can't just fake the face in front of you, right? It's not like someone just tags in a badge and you just follow them through the door. Um, and then, but also for like other type of resource inventory, obviously. And I think you know like Amazon and their you know, stores where you just pick up things from a basket and walk out is kind of a good example of those. Um, and then the last one was um, with using kind of similar stuff with like the MapWise workshop that's going on outside as well um, and talking about adding um, facial recognition or like voice recognition in order to help like people with disabilities be able to navigate um, or, you know, just generally traverse through certain environments and things like that as well. Cool. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. So what did you guys think about the, the discussion format? Did you guys like that? Do you have good discussions? Yeah, that was good. OK, so we will um, continue to find ways to incorporate that in. And we would definitely want to give you that time to you know, spend with the community on topics that you bring um, to, to discuss. All right, so we're going to finish up. Um, today we've got more tech talks going on, more lightning demos, more workshops. A lot of the workshops are repeated today, so if you missed one yesterday, you might be able to catch it again today. We have three new food trucks for lunch, um, so check that out. And then remember to come back here and reconnect for closing. We've got the fun prizes and also an opportunity to give some feedback and talk with the community some more. So we'll see you back here this afternoon. Thank you very much. Oh, what's that? Oh, last minute. For the five people who presented the use cases, uh, please go to the registration desk. We have a special prize for you. Oh, thank you. Very thank much. you.
Excellent. Nice.